Let's remain standing just a moment. Precious Lord, we come to thy divine presence again by the way of prayer. First to give thanks for all that you have done for us and for the great uh, love in our heart for thee and thy word. Lord, these people tonight that I love with all my heart, they have sacrificed and come to sit in a hot room. And what more? Because they love thy word. And we come to pray for the sick tonight, Lord, and the needy. May there not be a feeble person in our midst at the end of this service. Hallelujah. Reward them for their faithfulness, Lord. Speak to us through thy word and strengthen us, Lord, as we go bearing the reproach. What a privilege to do this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And be seated. I could not find words, of course, to express my gratitude towards a group of people like this that would come and sit in this building. I want to say that tomorrow uh, we're going to uh, go to over to Topeka, Kansas for the next meeting. And uh, that will end up the following Sunday. And then we go from there to Philadelphia. And now we're supposed to be going overseas, over to Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda uh, in the, the tribes in there. And they're having a little uprise now with the mamas. I can't get in as a missionary, but I'm going to try to get in as a hunter. Go in and they're fixing up. Usually I go in as a missionary and go hunting. This time I'm going as to go hunting to be a missionary. <laughs> so there's they're any way to get in there to them. And uh, uh, Brother uh, Matson Bose is there on the job trying to get me in to fix a safari that I come in to go hunting. Well, then I come in on this safari. Then he's going to say, our brother Branham is in the land. Go down to the embassy. Would it be all right if we just held a little meeting out here? See, that gets us started then. Let's keep it rolling. So we don't know where this is going to be. We're going to be able to do that or not. We're trying. And I've asked the Lord, if something happens that he can't, then it'll be a sign to me that I'm to come back here to Jeffersonville and preach the seven trumpets along July or August, somewhere along in there. And then if we do, we're seeing today, we're going to try to get this schoolroom here that's air conditioned because it'd be real nice and cool seats uh, 15 1800 people and it's air conditioned a brand new place just about five squares above this and one time we asked for it and uh, they wouldn't let us have it and the man that wouldn't let us have it was thrown off the board so now the man that's on there now says we can have it anytime we want it so we are we are very happy to get it and so we may be able to get that now and uh, sometime in July and have how many would be praying if the Lord's will now if something turns us down you know I like Arizona it's a wonderful country I've always longed to be there if you push it up a little bit brother Ben if you will if it's oh the, yes if it, or ever who's on it'll step it up just a little bit cause um, <clears throat> coming back out of that real uh, what I say or just the tapes oh here's the other one up here I'm sorry okay brother Ben um so uh, coming back from Arizona, uh, coming in here, it makes me just a little bit hoarse because of uh, uh, change in climate. Here we have about 87 to 90 and sometimes 100% humidity. And there it gets to zero. And then sometimes on an average, one twentieth of 1% humidity. You're just living under an oxygen tent. And then come out from under that to here. You know what a great uh, difference it makes in you. So it does bother you in the voice and so forth. Pull it where it was at, if you will, Brother Ben. I made a mistake and pulled it out. I thought that was put up here is where they step it up at. Now, pray for us, every one of you. I do appreciate you. Billy was telling me uh, somebody brought us a basket of peaches and just little gifts that you... Uh, I, I just can't thank you enough. I, I don't know how to do it. And I... I feel so unworthy to take things like that uh, from you. I pray God will bless you. And I know He will. Or He said, In so much as you do unto the least of these, you have done it to me. 
and God will bless you, I'm sure. And Arizona being such a nice country, there's one thing that I miss. That's you all. I miss you all. I, I don't care where I go. I, I, it, ain't, it isn't you. I have friends everywhere around the world. But it, it, isn't, it isn't you all. There's something about this little group that just, I don't know. I think about them. And in Tucson, it's a tourist city, you know, and the churches are pulling, you know, it's kind of hard, not very spiritual. And uh, because this competition is very strong and it makes it hard. If I could have all of you all plus the church, <laughs> then live out there, I guess it'd be all right. See, But I suppose as long as it stays the church and you're all still coming, I'll still be here until Jesus comes. So pray for me, as I said a while ago. I don't mean to repeat it, but when I get before you, I, I get nervous and I get melancholy and sentimental and uh, temperamental too. I am that to begin with. So uh, uh, it makes me all tore up inside. But to know that wherever I can go, I have a, a group on earth that I know of that sticks by me like this group. May, may God let us be so inseparable that in the kingdom that is to come, may we be there together. My prayer. Sitting here at the door talking to Bill Dow just a moment ago for leading someone back to Christ again in the other room. But sitting there talking to him, 91 years old, he said, uh, I'm getting weak. My eyes are not like they should be. And I think a couple of years ago I come to him when he had a complete heart failure and heart block. He was dying. And the very doctor that was doctoring him, it said he couldn't get well, the doctor's dead. And here sits Bill down. Of 91 years old. I said, Bill, you're no more use in the earth as far as working and things like that. But I'm asking this. God, give you strength because you love the meeting so well. That 91-year-old man crosses the nation in an automobile. Hot, dry, cold, indifference, anything it is, to hear the word. God bless that gallant soul. Now, I haven't I've got one more apology of keeping you the way I did this morning on a three hour. And I didn't do justice to the message because I cut it up and left part of it and skipped part of it and so forth. That's the reason I told him to hold the tape. Let me get it again somewhere where it's cool or something. And I, I, I could feel the spirit. But I'm looking at you and snowing your fan in and knowing you're hot. And, and that just tears me to pieces. I don't want you to suffer. I, I want you to be comfortable. See, And that worries me. Like I see sick people. If I can't. If I can't feel for those sick people, I can't do them no good. I, I've got to feel for them. And the same way with, uh, with you. I, I've got to feel for you. I can't be your brother. See, I, I've got to feel for you. And I do that. God knows that that's true. And now, tonight, I'll give to praying for the sick. And I want to command and bless these men and Brother Collins and Hickerson, Brother... Neville, Brother Caps, the trustees and all, for the fine reports that's been coming of how you're orderly setting the church and how everything's becoming into its right position. I'm grateful to you, man. The Lord bless you for trying to carry out an order. And uh, letter after letter comes into Tucson to me. Brother Branham, it's not like it used to be. It's so much different. Such a blessed feeling of the presence of God. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. The Lord ever bless you. And then, now, tonight I was reading here in the Scripture a little place to, to maybe set out a few words to speak and read a Scripture and then maybe a couple of Scriptures and talk to you for a few moments and then pray for the sick. Not but just a few moments. I'm watching the clock. And I'll try to make it just as quick as possible. But I do think that when a crowd of people are gathered together without reading the word or doing something, some exhortation, the meeting wouldn't be complete. Many of you's waited. Many of you's got miles to travel yet tonight. How I admire that. How I look and see each one and think about there in Arizona. I think when I see him again, I'm going to walk right down, shake his hand and hug his neck. And here you are sitting here. And I, where can I go? You know. I just don't know which one to start at, which how to get out of it. 
But, yeah, I love you. God loves you too. Now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, if I haven't got the, the wrong scripture laying out here, I want to read out of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse, and also read 2 Corinthians 12, 11, to take a text. Now, if I can find those right quick, and then we'll read, and then pray, and start right in, just speaking to you for a few minutes on a little subject. In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? May I quote that again? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? What is the wisdom of this world and foolishness? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which hath believed. Can I read that verse again? Listen closely. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. And in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 11th verse, Paul speaking, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commanded of you. For in nothing am I behind in the very chiefest apostle, though I be nothing. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, add to these few words tonight that's been spoken in days gone by by the great apostle Paul, that we might prosper by hearing them tonight and applying them to our lives, that we might be the, the handiwork of God made in the fashion in which He has chosen for us to be in. For we ask it in Jesus' name, Amen. I'm going to preach tonight for a few minutes, the Lord willing, upon the subject of the oddball. Now that's a very crude, rude uh, a text to take, but that's, uh, I think, would more or less state it the way that I want to express it. You know, there's so many things today that people become oddballs, we call it, and that expression, if anyone has never heard it, it means somebody that's peculiar, somebody that's odd to another fellow, and no doubt but what Many of us are odd one to another. And now, I was going down the street one time in Los Angeles, California, and I seen a very odd person, acting odd. And he's walking down the street, not picketing, but he was just merely like taking an afternoon stroll. And I went to the other side of the street to see what he was doing. 
Everybody was turning around and laughing at him because of his peculiarity. I noticed he had a sign hanging on the front of him. And I thought I'd see what everybody was laughing about, this odd, peculiar man. And so he was, I noticed him as the people looked at him. They laughed at him, and, and but he seemed to have a different kind of a smile. A smile of contentment. The other smiles that the people were giving him was more like a, a ridiculing him. But he seemed to be satisfied in what he was doing. Well, that's a whole lot to think about when a man's satisfied and what he's doing is right. Though he be an oddball to somebody else, if he is satisfied that what he's doing is right, then let him stay with it. And as I come close to the little man, I noticed on across his chest here on a plaque or a board was wrote, I am a fool. And at the bottom I had for Christ. I am a fool in great letters. Down at the bottom said for Christ. And everybody was laughing at this. And as the little man pressed on down to the crowd of jeers and carrying on, I turned to look what was on his back. And there was a great big question mark on his back and down at the bottom said, Now whose fool are you? <laughs> well, I, I thought he had something there. He said. Uh, uh, but he seemed to be satisfied that he could be a fool for Christ. And that's what Paul said he had become. A fool for Christ. Uh, Brother Troy, uh, the full gospel businessman, a very good friend of mine, he, he's a meat cutter. And getting some kind of a germ in his hand from cutting pork one time, I some man who knows or woman might know what the germ was, but it, it'll eat you up. So in order to save his life, they had to to amputate three fingers. And he only has two fingers on one hand. But yet he remains as a butcher. And there was a little German who worked with him in a, a butcher shop down in Los Angeles. Uh, so he, uh, he kept trying to lead the little uh, Dutchman to uh, Christ. And uh, he said he was a Lutheran and it was all right with him. He was satisfied. That he was a Christian because he belonged to the Lutheran church, as he stated it. So one night, Brother Troy had the privilege of getting him to go to church. His name was Henry. And Henry in German is Heinrich. And so they call him Heine. You've heard that expression. He said, Heine, how about going to church with me tonight? Well, he said, I believe I'll go. So he went down to an old-fashioned meeting where he was having a prayer meeting. And he really got under conviction and gave his heart to Christ. Oh, the next day, this little Dutchman was enjoying himself. Every once in a while, he would just walk through the building with his hands up in the air, saying, praise be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And he attracted the attention to all of all of them. You see, he become an oddball to the whole line of meat cutters. And he'd be cutting meat. He'd start thinking about the Lord. He'd start crying. He'd lay the knife down and walk up and down the aisles. Not hysterically, but just uh, making love to Christ. Saying, oh, how I love you, Jesus. You know, just walking back and forth. And the boss came by and seen him do this. And as he went walking down, crying in the boss. He never noticed the boss. He was thinking about Jesus. And he started down with his hands up in the air and the tears rolling down his cheeks, saying, Oh, God, how I love you. And the boss said, Heine, what in the world has happened to you? He said, Everybody in the, in the whole line is talking about it. What in the world's happened to you, Heine? The little Dutchman said, oh, boss, he said, glory to God, I got saved. <laughs> he said, you got what? He said, I got saved. 
He said, I went with Brother Troy here down to a little mission and I, I got saved and Jesus came into my heart and I'm so full of love. He said, you must have went down to that bunch of nuts. He said, yeah. He said, glory to God. He said, thank God for the nuts. <laughs> He said, you know, you take an automobile coming down the road and you take all the nuts out of it, you ain't got nothing but a bunch of yunk. <laughs> well, I don't know but what the little Dutchman is just about right. Take all the nuts out, the nuts is what holds it together. And I think that's what holds the church together sometimes. Holds civilization together. Now... Coming down from a visit at Prescott a few days ago, I was looking at the desert and noticing how that out of Phoenix they had the Japanese gardens. And they had flowers in there, beautiful flowers. Where when I was a boy out there, I herded cattle down through those places. The cows, well, no grass, so they just lived on cactus beans and so forth. And then I noticed that there has been a, a reproduction to the use of the desert. And in the desert, we find that the cactus and the flowers and in our home there, or the home we're renting, Sister Larson, I think she was here this morning, I seen her. And uh, she has a flower bed on the outside. Of, of the house, some dirt, everything there is sand. So she had some dirt and a large flower bed on each side of the duplex. And every morning, I have to get out and water those flowers. If I don't water them, they'll die. And they'll, and then again, I have to get some spray and spray them to keep the lice off of them. And the bugs will eat them up. And then you go just a little beyond that, 30 feet from that, there's some flowers growing, and out in the desert they're growing, and you could dig down 20 feet, and it'd be like a powder keg. Nothing in the world but just dust. And there's no water at all. And who sprays them? See, these in the flower bed, if you fail to spray them and to water them, the termites or the bugs, lice will eat them up. But the lice can't touch that one out there in the desert. And neither does he have to be babied and watered every day. He is a production of the Creator. This is a hybrid reproduction. And I think that today the reason Christianity has become to the people a nut is because that we've got a bunch of reproductions and not genuine Christians. A bunch that has to be babied and sprayed and in order to stay in the church. I can imagine the very first church, what they were, you compare it with this reproduction today, this would be a cheap production of what the real first church was, that rugged believers in God with the Holy Ghost. Amen. You baby, not them. You didn't have to pat them and tell them you take them in this one, and if they get tired of that one, they go to another one, and you'll make them a deacon if they'll come over here and leave this other one. That's a hybrid reproduction. Now, I was thinking of Michelangelo's original painting. I believe of the Last Supper. I think he painted it. Do you realize what that original picture would cost you? It would be countless thousands of dollars. Would never touch that original because it's beyond price. It's so valued so high. But you can buy a cheap reproduction of it for about $2. That's why people today can't understand the ruggedness of real, genuine believers. They become a nut. You know, 
The world gets in such a rut that every once in a while you have to have a nut to straighten it out. Take somebody, come on the scene, it's a little different. And he is a nut to that generation. I was thinking the other day, who is able? Who today is not a nut? You're somebody's nut. I believe the world is completely going insane. Did you know it's a time that people can't judge between right and wrong? Or truth or error? Do you know the politicians can't judge right and wrong? You see them keeping quiet on this vote in the Bible back in the church, or into the Bible back into the school? They don't know which way the politics are going to blow. Think of it. I don't know how it is in Indiana now, but in the state of Arizona, it's against the law to read the Bible in school. I think it's the same thing in Indiana. Or nearly the whole United States because some infidel woman changed the whole program. And remember, it's against the law to read the Bible in our public schools, but believers' taxes supports infidelity to be taught in the school. Politics, we need another Abraham Lincoln. We need another Patrick Henry. We need an American who can stand out regardless of where the politics are and call right, right, and wrong, wrong. Did you know preachers today can't judge which is right, the Word of God or the church denomination? They don't know which road to take. They can't judge between right and wrong. I know the Bible says it, but our church says. See, people are not capable of judging right from wrong. Anything is contrary to the Bible is wrong. God's word is right and every man's word is a lie. It's contrary to it. And to try to stand now upon a, a, a time like that and to stand for what's right, you become a nut. Let's call a few characters. I can imagine the prophet Noah in that great day that he lived in. That great scientific age where they built pyramids and sphinx. Where they could prove that there was no water in the skies but scientific research. And here comes this old man out there and said there's coming rain out of the heavens. Noah was a nut to that generation. He become a nut. Let's think of Moses. Moses. When he went down to Pharaoh, as we spoke this morning, and Moses going down to Pharaoh and saying, The Lord sent me down to bring these slaves out with a stick in his hand against the great army that had the whole world conquered. Pharaoh and all of his scientific genius thought Moses was a nut. And he was a nut to them. I can imagine the prophet Elijah in his great day when the fabulous uh, age of fashion when Ahab and Jezebel ruled the world as it was in them days. And all the fashions and things that Jezebel wanted to wear and how she had all the women uh, dressing like her and her paints and going on, her fashions, the way that she uh, fashioned herself. And when some old crank, like Elijah, come out on the scene and withstood the whole nation, that Ahab, he was a nut. That's right. Amos, the prophet, when he come to Samaria in the day that Samaria was like Hollywood today, the women on the street dressing and even public adultery, how they carry on and live out there, letting man. It's almost a public adultery today right before you. I went to a certain place the other night to get something to eat. And the little boys and girls up there hugging and kissing like I don't know what. And do you know, my little sister, that that's potentially an adultery? When a man kisses you, he's potentially committed adultery with you.
You should never let him kiss you until you're married. For the glands, both male and female glands, is in the lips. Do you understand? And when male and female glands come together, let it be where it may be. You have potentially committed adultery. And you shouldn't let a boy kiss you until that veil is raised on your face and you're his wife. Don't do that. It's committing adultery. It's mixing male and female glands. Why don't a man kiss a man? A woman kiss a woman in the lips. Because it don't cross the glands. Children is born by crossing glands. So it's almost a public adultery again. Everywhere. Look on the screens and everything you see. A, a slobber and a, a carry on. No wonder immorality is on the, is on the incline. How can they do it and burn themselves all up by kissing those women in the mouth? Knowing that that's adultery. God won't forgive it. Unless you repent. And now, when coming up, uh, this great prophet Amos, he's known as one of the minor prophets because there wasn't too much road of him. But he had the word of the Lord and he looked out upon that city, all given in the parks, men sitting with their arms around women and women with their arms around men, just a modern Hollywood. And he walked down to that city and said, you'll repent or perish. He was a nut. He had almost declared himself insane to them. John, the Baptist, when he came on the scene to the religious denominations that day, he was a nut. He had the opportunity to become a priest to follow his father's footsteps. But he refused to do it because God had kept him out of those creeds and denominations. Because his job was too important, he was to announce the Messiah coming. And when he had nothing to do with either Pharisee, Sadducee, or whatever it was, he rejected the whole group of them and said, Don't you begin to say we have Abraham to our father, for I say that God's able to these stones to rise children to Abraham. To the, to the religious world of his days, he was a nut. That's right. When Jesus came on the scene to the religious people of his days, he was also a nut. Because they said, you are a Samaritan. You're out of your mind. You're a madman. In other words, a crazy man. He was that to the people, your Lord and Savior. No wonder Paul, trained by Gamaliel to be a priest, the opportunity is someday becoming a high priest. And on his road down to Damascus, he was struck down by a supernatural light. And he looked up being a Jew and know that pillar of fire was what led his people. He said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. And when he forfeited his education, he forfeited all of his theology, that he had been trained in the school. And become a regular street preacher. He was a nut. He said, I have become a fool. And the people thought he was mad. Beside himself. He told Festus, I'm not man. He just knew the Lord. But to know the Lord in a religious group. I hope you don't miss it. To know Jesus this day amongst a religious group, you are a nut. Amen. It hasn't changed. I could dwell much on this, but I, I want to hurry up for the prayer line. Martin Luther, that little German priest, that packing the communion one day, threw it down on the steps and said, This is not the body of Jesus Christ. This is only bread that's been made back there. And he declared that the just shall live by faith. He was a nut to the Catholic Church. They could have assassinated him for that. 
But he was a nut. And they just let him alone. But he become a nut to that generation. John Wesley, in the days of the great immoral hour of England, when a Wesleyan revival had to come on the scene, the whole world was corrupted. Immorality everywhere. And the Anglican church had got so far away to no more revival. Such Calvinistic thinking. And John Wesley come on the scene with the, the uh, word of sanctification. Cleaning up the immoral. He became a nut. Quoting Mr. Wesley once. In his book, he was coming down a path. And one of the men of the England church, they all thought he was crazy. So he stood in the path. Mr. West, he was a little bitty man. This great big fellow thought he'd just get to slap him down. So he stood in the path. Mr. Wesley walked up and said, pardon me, sir. Would you step out of the way? I'm in a hurry. And the Angulin said to him, I don't step out of the way for a fool. Mr. Wesley politely tipped his hat, walked around him, said, I always do. <laughs> so you see, that was one... Who was the nut? One was for Christ. The other one was for the church. So you're somebody's nut. Yet, when the Pentecostals came on the scene 50 years ago, they said them people are crazy. They were nuts. That's right. Because they condemned all that corruption that was in the church ages at that time when they come on the scene. But what has the Pentecostals done? Went right back into the vomit that they come out of. Amen. Right back into the denominational corruption. Amen. You know what? It's time for another nut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's time for another one. That's right. Notice a nut. Before there is a nut, there is a bolt to fit that nut. And that nut is threaded to that bolt. If it don't, it's a misfit. Notice. All who was threaded in the days of, of uh, Noah, threaded to the gospel message, Noah the nut pulled him into the ark. Amen. It depends what your threads are. What you're threaded to. If you're threaded to the world, they'll pull you. If you're threaded to the word, it'll pull you. Amen. It depends on which you're threaded to. What nut you'll follow. But Noah being a nut with the word of God. A nut to the scientific age and to the religious age that he lived in. He pulled them that would be saved into the ark. Amen. 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 Those that were predestinated. The bolt that was made before the nut. The bolt must be threaded to the nut. So Satan, he has some bolts and nuts too. Bolts and nuts of the kingdoms of this world. Pharaoh was just as much nut to Noah or to Moses as Moses was to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, with all his scientific gimmicks, had pulled his nation to himself. Noah, by being a nut for God, pulled the church to the promised land. Amen. Depends on which way you're threaded. He pulled the church out of Egypt. As Noah pulled the church out of the world to the ark. Moses pulled the church from Egypt to God's promised land. Jesus said, now be careful. Because these nuts and bolts look a whole lot alike. Just watch the thread. Matthew 24, 24, he said it would almost deceive the very elected. Now, 
The, the American and the whole world denomination needs a nut. The Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterian, they're all scattered out and this, that, and all fighting. And after all, they're all threaded to the same bolt. So God's given them a bolt and sending them a nut. The World Council of Churches. It'll pull them all together. That's right. <laughs> it sure will. It'll pull them together. <laughs> the World Council. Amen. You know, it got to here not long ago. There can't be nothing happen to cause without a reason. The women want to strip their clothes off. They want to wear shorts. They wanted to still belong to church. They wanted to wear all these kinis or what you call the things. They want to do that and they want to still belong to church. They want to scream, holler, and dance. Worship. That's a worship. Now, if I had time, I'd prove that to you. That is a devil worship. Dancing like that and doing those things. I could prove it to you in the heathen lands. They wanted to worship and maintain their testimony and still remain in church. So God give them a nut. Two or three of them. One named Elvis Presley, one Pat Boone and Ernie Ford can sing hymns and everything else and still claim to be a Christian. It's a nut. It's not threaded to the Word. Right. Now, I said I'd be through in a half hour and it's up. But listen, the world wants a nut. The devil sees they get it. They're already threaded for it. But while the world is being threaded for a nut, there's a people called the bride. Amen. It's threaded too. Amen. Just as sure as I'm standing here, God will send him a nut. Amen. That'll pull the bride out of this chaos Amen. into the presence of God. Amen. It'll be a word threaded nut. <laughs> A critic a few days ago said to me down in Tucson, he said, you know, some people make you a nut and others make you a God. I said, well, that kind of runs all right. I know he's trying to criticize me. He said, people think you're a God. I said, well, just, uh, I know the people didn't do that. But I, I know he didn't understand it because he's on the other side of the skin, you see. So I know he didn't, he didn't know it. So I said, that's not too far away from the Word of God, is it? Hey? Just let him just let him know we wasn't lost. <laughs> we know where we were standing. We know what kind of sails we had set and what kind of wind was blowing it. We know what our thread was and what our nut was. And we know how we were standing. I said, that's not contrary to the Word of God so much, is it? I said, remember, when God was sending Moses down to the children of Israel, God made Moses a God. That's right. And made also Aaron, his brother, a prophet. That's right. All the prophets, Jesus said, were gods. They were God's man. That's right. God means it that way. Listen. The word that we preach, and the word that I said this morning, God hiding behind skins. Badger skins. God hiding behind the skin of a man. See? That's what He did. When God was manifest in the world, He was hiding behind or veiled behind the skin of a man called Jesus. He was veiled and hiding behind the skin of a man called Moses. And they were gods. Not gods, but they were God, the one God, just changing his mask. Doing the same thing each time. Bringing this word. See, God made it that way. He knows that man's got to see something. There isn't ever one of us born into the world. Like I was telling you this morning, nobody was daring to follow Moses in there. God never did deal with two. He deals with one. Always. No one was daring to impersonate Moses. It was death, natural death. 
to try to impersonate him, to go in that pillar of fire with him. So people are not all made. You're not born in that way to break out into that supernatural. But God sets some on the earth to represent him as an ambassador from him. And that ambassador is ordained of God to go into the great unknown supernatural and discern and bring out things that the natural mind cannot perceive it. It brings out the mystery of God, foretells things that is and things that will has been and things that will be. What is it? God. God behind skins. Amen. Human skin. Amen. That's exactly right. Sam Conley lives in Tucson. He come here once many years ago with Mr. Kidd and was healed with a standing ulcer for many years. When I went out last fall, Sam had a, a stone that the specialist there in, in Tucson examined it. It was as big as a marble. Brother Sam Conley, many of you here know him. He's from Ohio. And he went to the doctor and he said, Sam, make yourself ready next week. I'll take that stone out a couple days from then. He said, can I pass the stone, doctor? He said, it's impossible. The stone is too big. So he got him in a car and took him home. And he called. He said, I want you to come over and pray for me, Brother Brown. Why did he call me for such? And I started to pray for him. I said, Sam, it's thus saith the Lord. The stone will pass by itself. And the next morning he took the stone to the doctor. And he said, the doctor said, Mr. Connell, I don't understand how it happened. And he said, I am a believer in God. And God passed the stone for me, took it from me. The man could hardly believe it, the doctor. Just the more he could believe that big tumor leaving my wife's side, you know about, see. So he said, uh, about six months later, which is about three, about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, Sam Conley was stricken down by a serious heart condition. And I don't know the name of Carter or some kind of a heart block or ever what it is. It's a very dangerous. It won't, you can't get over it they claim. A heart attack and his heart blocked. And his limbs swelled out to his ankles were larger than his leg up here high around his hip. So they took him down to the doctor. The doctor said, take him home peacefully. Or to the hospital. Sam said, I don't want to go to the hospital. Said, take him home and put him in the bed and don't you move head, hand, or foot for six months. Said, you could die at any minute. And Brother Norman called and we went over that night to see Brother Sam. And when we prayed for him, and the Lord spoke. And the next morning, Sam went down to the doctor's office with his Richie legs pulled up, stood before the doctor and said, Look at me, doctor. And the doctor put him under an electrical cardiogram and he said, I don't understand it. He said, Go on back to work. He said, What church do you belong to? He said, I don't belong to any of them. He said, You can't be a Christian without belonging to them denominations. You have to be. See, that's all the doctor know. Sam was a nut to him. And he was a nut to Sam. But I asked such a question. Then what happened? Sam come over and he said, What can I say to anybody that tells me such things, Brother Bram? Tell them that you belong to the one and only church. You don't join it. It's not a denomination. You're born into it. A little lady. About six months ago, leaning on the bosom of Sister Norman, I forget her name, very 
a pretty little woman, about 30 years old. Her and her husband had separated and she took leukemia and she had been in such a condition that she could hardly get around. And finally it got worse until the doctors put her in a bed and the doctors visited her until the time come they give her until the following Wednesday. She'd be dead by Wednesday. And Miss Norman somehow got her out of the bed and brought her over and had to hold her up in a chair. And as the little fellow sat there pitching back and forth and gray as she could be, yellow over the skin from the cancer, leukemia, I said, well, I can pray for you, sister. And her trying to speak in the tears in her eyes, she said, I, I said, are you a Christian? She said, I'm a Methodist. I said, I, I asked you if you was a Christian. And she said, you mean belong to the Christian church? I said, no, ma'am. I mean, are you born to the Spirit of God and love the Lord Jesus? She said, well, I've always belonged to the church. I said, if God will let you live, will you promise me that you will return to me and let me show you the way of the Lord more plainer? She said, I promise God anything if you'll spare my life. I'll serve him. Just then a vision come. Said, Thus saith the Lord. Don't make ready. Tear up your things for your death day after tomorrow. As on Monday, she's to die Wednesday. You're not going to die. Last Sunday, a week from this Sunday, I sat with her in the room, gained 30 some odd pounds. The doctor said there's not one trace of the leukemia can be found anywhere. And she wanted to know, and I sent her down to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in an irrigation ditch. <laughs> the way of the Lord. Might be a nut. But if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I visit up at, uh, the boy used to take tapes here, Leo Mercer. He's got a trailer court. And I've been praying for some people. I prayed for a, a little lady named Loker, I believe it was. And she'd had 14 operations of cancer. And the doctors give her up to die. And was prayed for and told her she would not die. But she would live. And there's not a trace of it anywhere. And because of that, 28 of her family were standing there saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Might be a nut. But it's drawing all men unto Him that will come. It's threaded with the Word. You see what I mean? I got a letter that came in day before yesterday laying right back there in the file. Last fall, while on a hunting trip, the last spring is a year ago, an Indian boy named Oscar that we hunt on the highway up there with us where the angel of the Lord, I told you across here, would bring that caribou and, and that uh, silver tip grizzly, all of you remember. Yes, then that boy, when I walked into the, he walked into the tent last spring and when Bud asked me to ask the blessing, he took off his gloves, his riding. He put them gloves on and was ready to go out. He was a Catholic. It had nothing to do with it. Last fall, when he couldn't stand it by my side, when his mother was back there dying with a heart attack, he said, won't you come back and pray for her? I went back in this little hut of the Indians there, and there all of them gathered around this mother and her dying, couldn't speak a word of English, and the Holy Spirit came down and told the mother through an interpreter, her daughter, what had taken place, which was even called her name and told her what she was and what tribe she was from and how that this had happened. And the mother was instantly healed. Amen. And the next morning when I went back to see him, as I rode out going 40 miles back for a sheep, there they was all sitting there. She was all getting on the horse to go back to dry moose meat. And I said, last night when I prayed, I said, Our Father who art in heaven, I said, Louise, I, I was a Catholic prayer. You all started, and then, of course, I left you. And I said, now, nah, I'm just going to thank God. We don't say prayers. We pray. She said, we ain't no more Catholic. She said, we believe like you believe. We want you to take all of us and baptize us the way you baptize. We want the Holy Ghost. On the trip back, 
the boy had lost his horses months before that, couldn't find them. And the guy was bawling him out, said, Oscar, you know better than to leave them horses like that. The bears, a lot of grizzlies, uh, would eat them horses up at this time. And he kept standing close to me. And he said, um, one night he said, me ask you something? I said, yeah. He said, Brother Branham, pray God. God, give me my ponies back. <laughs> I said, Bud said the bear eat him up. He said, Brother Branham, ask God. God give Oscar his ponies back. I said, you believe that, Oscar? He said, I believe. God, make my mother well. God tell you where bear was, where game was. That God know where game is, know where my horses is. A year ago, while standing back there with Fred Softman, he's here tonight. Billy Paul, my son, the Holy Spirit came down. I said, Oscar, you'll find your ponies. They'll be standing in snow. There lays the letter. Wrote me last week and I got it a Friday. Come in here, slain right there in the file now. Brother Branham, Oscar, find ponies standing in snow. <laughs> How they live, nobody knows. They're, the boy, at this time of year, June, they so much snow, they steal 20 or 30 foot of snow around them. How did they stay there through the winter in this canyon? Oscar can get into them on snowshoes, but of course he can't put snowshoes on his pony. But he found them according to the word of the Lord. It might sound like a nut. Just believe it one time. Depends on how your threads are. Now, it won't thread up with the denomination. It'll only thread with the Word. But there's some people in the world believes that Word. It'll take a nut to wrap that bride out of here this tree. For the bride and the bridegroom are one. And the God is one and the Word is God. It'll have to be threaded with the Word. And it'll draw the bride out of these denominations. Yeah, he wanted to criticize me. You know, it reminds me of talking about this morning, God hiding behind skins, skin of man. A little story, and then I'm closing. Sorry, I done kept you here about 45 minutes now. There's a home, Christian home. And there was a, I told this to this critic. And in this home, there was, they believed in God. They had a little boy there. But he's scared to death in a storm. Lightning. Oh, he's just scared to death. He'd run our tables anywhere when it was lightning. So one night, there come a big storm out on the farm and where they lived. And trees was blowing and lightning flashing. Getting late in the night. The mother said to Junior, said, now, Junior, you go upstairs and go to bed. Said, now, don't be scared. Go on up there. So a little junior with his pajamas on went up the steps looking back, about half crying. He laid down, tried to go to sleep, covered up his head. He couldn't go to sleep. That lightning flashing around the window. So I said, oh, mom. <laughs> said, come up here and sleep with me. Well, she said, junior, nothing's going to bother you. That lightning can't hurt you. He said, but mama... Come up here and sleep with me. So the mother went up the steps and laid across the bed with her junior. And she said, Junior, my little son, mother wants to tell you something. She said, Junior, we are a Christian family. We believe in God. And we believe that God protects us in storms. We believe that. And we believe that God takes care of his own. And said, I want you to believe that, Junior. That don't be as scared. God is with us. And he'll protect us. Junior snubbed a few times. He said, Mama, I believe that too. He said, but when that lightning's so close to the window, I like the feel of God. It's got skin on it. <laughs> so, I think that all of us adults think the same thing. God was skinned.
God with skin on it. It might sound like a nut to the world, but it's drawing all men unto Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as the little stories of, of experiences, and sometimes they happen for a reason, and it's yet as rude as it is, yet we understand it in the language that it happened in. So we thank Thee tonight, Lord, that, that God can house Himself in us. We are thankful that there was a propitiation made. The blood of the righteous one, Jesus, who was the fullness of God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that He laid down His precious life, not taken from Him, but willfully laid it down, that we might enjoy Him in the fullness of His presence, in the Shekinah glory that He lived in, that our souls might be sanctified with that blood, that the great Holy Spirit itself could live in us. And we become teachers, prophets, and so forth to the people of those, Lord, who are needy. Gifts of God. God Himself manifesting, glowing out the great gifts of God in the presence of this modern age. And the rude expression, Lord, of being a nut. And we know that in this day that it takes some time when the world gets in a rut like the church is today, just joining new churches and new denominations. A man who comes forth with the word is considered a nut, an insane person. As the great apostle Paul, who was trained to be a theologian, a priest, and yet he said he'd become a fool for the glory of God. He forsook his education that the people might listen to his high polished words. And he said he come not with enchanting words and wisdom of man that their faith would be in such. How the church has turned to that today as he prophesied after my departure, wolves shall enter in, not sparing the flock. But he said he came to them in power and manifestations of the Holy Spirit that their faith would be in God. Father, he became a fool to the world to know Jesus. And so do we today, Lord. There's people sitting here that's considered crazy because that they're ready to trust God for their healing, for their eternal destination, placing their reputation at stake and worship to Him, thanking Him, praising Him, giving freedom to their spirit to worship God. They're considered crazy. But you said that the, the foolishness of God, if we are fools, was stronger and wiser than the wisdom of man. For man by wisdom know not God, but through the foolishness of preaching, it pleased God to save them that was savable. We pray, God, that the great author of this word will come tonight and heal the sick, save the lost. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I am lightning God, so that you won't be mixed up in what I said today. God is a great diamond, the eternal. And when a diamond is brought out of the blue stones of Africa, I've been in the mines and watched them in the great, how they process this and get the diamonds out, how they go through the crusher and the great blue fire diamonds, black diamonds come out. They have not much form, certain form. They're just a great stone. And really they have no fire in them at that time. They're just a diamond, a stone, round, smoothed out a lot of them. But this diamond must be cut. Now, it's against the law to have one not being cut. It must be cut and then you have to have a receipt where you bought it. Because it's millions of dollars in them. And I liken God to that diamond. Now, a diamond is cut 
so that it will reflect what's on the inside of it, the fire that's in the diamond. And it has to be cut to every little way, every little shape, three points. Put the three points to a diamond, and a light against a three-point object will give seven colors. Make seven colors. And now notice, God was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. See, he was cut, bruised, that great diamond that from him might reflect the gifts to the church. And it isn't the light because the light must return back when the sun's off of it to where it has been cut from. But every little piece that comes from that chipping is not destroyed. It's put to use. Many of them are made to Victrola needles. And those needles bring forth, that's been chipped from the diamond, bring forth music that's been canned into a record. I hope you see what I mean. The chip from Christ, the gift from Christ, put upon the Bible, speaks out the hidden mysteries of God to the believer. He knows the secret of the heart. He knows every person. Do you believe that? It would not be the diamond saying, you see what I am. It's what he come from. <laughs> the diamond is a diamond because he's off of a diamond. And that's the way the gifts of the Spirit is or to the person. It's a part of that diamond. It's sent and been brought down and brought into a gift to interpret, to preach, to teach. There's five spiritual gifts. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. And they're all for the edifying of the body of Christ. And just as sure as there's teachers... Pastors, there's got to be prophets. We know that. And we believe that God is to be manifested in the last day among His people to the elect seed, according to the Bible, in the form of prophet. That's exactly with the Word. Not that the man is God, but that the gift is God. See? And that's the needle. Now, a pen won't play that record right. A record sewing needle won't play it right. But a diamond, it's the best. It brings it out clear. A diamond pointed needle. May God tonight, your record of life, whatever is wrong with you, whatever that you're desiring from God, May the great master who holds the needle in his hand, may he put it upon your life and reveal to us what you're here for, what you want. Then we'll know that he's here. Heavenly Father, will you grant it before I start this prayer line, not aiming to do this, but will you grant it? That the people might know, maybe strangers here to be prayed for. I know not them, but you do. And Paul said, if you speak with tongues and there be no interpretation or give no edification, the people will say you're mad. But if one prophesies and reveals what's on the heart, then they'll say truly God's with you. Let it be again, God. In this late hour, you promised it, and so shall it be. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I wonder how many sick people in here tonight. That's here. Or did Billy give out prayer? Is there any prayer cards give out? Yes. There is. Well, I guess every sick person's got a prayer card. But I don't know what you wrote on it. I think he just gives you a card. You write what you want to on it. Is that it? Just got the card? You put on it whatever you want. I don't know you. How many here knows that I don't know you and yet you're sick? And you'd say this. What I've heard you say today, God behind skins, God behind human skin, veiling himself. But if you got spiritual eyes, you could open and see him. See who he is. You believe that.
Jesus said, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he also. More than this shall he do, for I go to the Father. Now, if you believe with all your heart, how many in here that's sick and knows that I do not know you, know what's wrong with you, just raise up your hand. Say, I'm sick, have need. How many has desires in their heart? Not sick, but has desires. You know what I mean? All right. There isn't very anybody that I've seen, but what held up their hand. Now, I don't know. I know this man sitting here. I'm sure that's Brother James. And I think that's Sister James. Brother Ben, I know it's your faces sometimes. The brother taking the pictures. But uh, that's somebody back in here anywhere. Just, I, I, I challenge this on the basis and the closing of this message. Do you know God promises to happen in the last days? He made the promise. See? Now, I can't make it happen. See, I, I cannot do that. He has to do that. He's the one who does it. Not me. But I believe in Him. Or I wouldn't be standing here telling you something that I didn't believe in. Now you pray and you say, Lord Jesus, I'm taught in the Bible that you're a high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. I don't care where you are. And you say, I believe you. And by faith, I believe what that man said today. That's what the angel told me. Get the people to believe you. And if I tell the word of God, it ain't believe me, it's believe the word. If it ain't with the word, then don't believe it. But if you believe it is the word, then whatever it is, you pray. And you believe. And see if he still can reveal what's in your heart. And anybody knows that the Bible said that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and discerns the thoughts and intents in the heart. That's how Abraham knew that that was God when he could tell what Sarah was saying back in the tent, what she was thinking about. When he said, I'll visit you, and Sarah thought in her heart, it can't be so. Now, I said he's here to heal you. What do you think about it? If you just believe. Now, I can't, I have no certain way Heavenly Father knows that. See? I just got to see it. What I see, I say, and what I, I don't see, of course, I can't say. But he's just as much God. Would that increase your faith if he'd do it? Preaching like that, it kind of throws me out a little bit. But he's here. I'm conscious of that. Watching a man as he bowed his head right back here. His wife sitting by and praying also. Right here. Got something on your heart. Your wife praying. Got a burden on your heart. It's for your mother-in-law. Right? You believe God can tell me what's wrong with your mother-in-law? I don't know you. We're strangers to one another. Is that right? You believe God can tell me what's wrong with her? She isn't here. I see a great distance. She's in east from here. She's in Ohio. That's right. She's suffering with a blood condition. Have your wife to take that handkerchief there. She's crying on place on her. Don't doubt. She'll get well. You believe that? Here's a little lady sitting right here in front of me. She's crying. There's something wrong with the child. I don't know. No, it's nothing wrong. She's just got a desire. She's desiring to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's thus saith the Lord. Believe, child, you're going to receive it. Here's a lady sitting out here on the end of the road. She's praying. I'm a stranger to her, but she's shadowed. You've had operations. If we're a stranger to each other, I suppose. I don't know you. You don't know me. Only just maybe hearing of me. 
You're not from here. You're a stranger among us. You're from uh, Wisconsin. The city is Milwaukee. And your trouble is cancer. It's on the breast. Operation after operation, yet without success. Let the faith that touched the hem of his garment believe it right now. Sink it in your heart. It shall come to pass. Have faith. A man sitting over in a corner here. He's praying for his mother. He's a stranger to me. I don't know him. But he's praying for his mother. And his mother has the same thing this woman has, cancer. Or she's scared of it. Which it is. There's a man you're praying for. That man has trouble with his back. He's also a seem intoxicated. He's an alcoholic. You're a brother. You're not from here. You're from Illinois. You believe God can tell me what your name is? Farmer. Is that right? Raise up your hand. Glory to God. Believe. There's somebody kneeling over somebody praying. Somebody laying on a cot. All right. Do you believe what you've heard to be the truth, lady? You do. If I could heal you, I'd come do it. But you're already healed by Christ. You just got to believe it. That lady standing there praying was praying for you to be touched. I don't know you. But God knows you. You're from out of town also. That's right. You're from Illinois. That's exactly. Uh, the city is called East Moline. Illinois. You suffer with cancer. You're a minister's wife. Do you believe? You'll die laying there. Why don't you accept him tonight and say, I can in my heart, with my faith above anything that you're, I believe that I'm healed. I'm in the presence of God. Rise up. Believe you can go home and be healed. There she is. You believe with all your hearts? Let us praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for all thy goodness and mercy. We thank Thee for You're still here, right in the midst of all this trouble and this world that's perverted, yet You're here. Let Thy Spirit, Lord, ever remain with us. We see that You're here, God, with skin on, in the human hearts, giving faith and revelation and vision. You're God in Your church. God in your people, we thank thee for this, Lord. And may everyone believe tonight with one accord, and may they be healed. Through Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. How many over there has prayer cards on that side? Let them that's on that side move back. Come right in the middle of this aisle. Them on that aisle. Come right out this way. Just take your place. Come right out this way. Let those, as soon as they are finished up, this line catch the next side. Elders, come here. Brother Roy. Lord bless you. I, know you said I want the deacons of the church here immediately, if they can get in from everywhere they're at, come here for a little help. I want each one that's going to be prayed for, raise up your hand. Say this behind me, Lord. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe that in your presence, as I follow your word, and my the hands is laid on me tonight, I'm going to accept my healing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Watch. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. If they lay their hands on the sick, 
they shall recover. He told Noah it was going to rain. It never, he never, I never said, as soon as, as you're prayed for, you're going to be well. He said, they shall recover. He told Noah it was going to rain. It never rained for 120 years, but it rained. He told Abraham he was going to have a baby by Sarah. It never happened for 25 years, but it had it. He told Isaiah a virgin was going to conceive. It never happened for 800 years, but she conceived. Is that right? He promised it. No matter how long it takes, he does it anyhow. Do you believe that? Come forward. Let Brother Cassius leave the seat. You'll move the card. I'll let everybody be in prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, we're going to obey your commandments by laying hands upon these sick people. I don't know one thing else you could do, though. For you have said in your word, you've purchased their healing. You've proved that you're here with us tonight, the word that can discern the thoughts that's in the heart. You have proved that, that you are among us. And I pray thee, Father, that your word, which cannot fail, will be made so real to each heart that you say, if you can believe it, don't doubt, but believe it. Say to this mountain, be moved. And don't doubt, but believe that it will come to pass. You didn't say when. You told the people at Pentecost to go up there and wait. You never said hours, days. You said until. Now they're coming to accept their healing. They, they never think of nothing else but their healing until the deliverance comes. We obey you by laying hands upon them as believers. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, come right by. You're healed. God bless you. Go to hell. That's good. Amen. All things are possible. If we could change them words now, I believe it's now. I You believe that what has been asked and desired shall be granted. Amen. Amen. It shall happen. Amen. I saw passing through the line a few moments ago some of my Italian friends from Chicago. Uh, how many know Sister Batazzi from Chicago? Well, you know she had a, a mental nervous break just recently. Very, very bad. But the morning in Chicago at the Christian Businessman's Breakfast, I told the sister, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, she'd come back to one side, and she was just going to hold herself together. And I said, Sister, you won't get over it right away, but you're going to be well. Amen. I said, it'll be either 18 months or two years. Right in that bracket, you'll be made well. The other day while speaking with her, I heard her testifying, so happy, the happy she'd ever been in all of her life. She was riding in a car. She had no peace. The presence of God seemed to have departed from her. Of course, it was mental nerve, you know. And all of a sudden, it returned with a great flow Hallelujah. of joy. And the power of the Holy Spirit was upon her. She wept. She cried. She, she had, they just had a great time. Amen. About three or four weeks ago or a month, and I heard her testify Sunday before last, and she said, Brother Branham, when I got back, I marked down and took that tape. And it was exactly 18 months to the day. Amen. 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 
Do you love him? <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? Now, the same Holy Spirit that can predict that exactly without missing one time. All these years, and through his word, has tried to uncover to you today that God isn't some object way off or some historic or something. He's a living present tense. His word made manifest. Hid himself in human veil in his church, revealing himself by your faith and my faith together, coming together, making the unit of God. I can do nothing without you. You can do nothing without me. Neither can do anything without God. So together it makes the unit, the connection. God sent me for the purpose. You believe it, and there it happens. That's just it. See? Confirmed perfectly. I don't care what's wrong with you, what anyone has said. If from your heart you believe that you're going to be well, there's nothing can ever stop it. He said so. And he said, the heavens and earth will pass away, but my Amen. word won't fail. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. How many will pray for me in other meetings as a goal? Amen. I'm one who needs prayer. See, everybody's turned me down. But you. And yet there's seed out there. I sent a letter to South Africa. They wouldn't let me come in unless I would sign a paper and I would baptize over on that side, everybody three times, once for the Father, and once for the Son, and the Holy Ghost, face forward. On the other side, I baptized backwards, one for the Father, and teach that was doctrine. I wrote him a letter. I said, the Holy Spirit's been trying for the last few years to get me in Africa again. He wants to use my ministry. There were 30,000 except Christ one afternoon. I said, remember, the blood of them souls be upon you, Amen. not upon me. I've offered to come, but you won't do it. I wonder what it'll be in this day. When Jesus, the Son of God, has been turned from the church, the Word rejected. But in, in all of that, He still is making Himself known to His people. Amen. Aren't you thankful for it? Amen. I passed by tonight, tapped my hands on them, some aged women, some young, some old, some young man, old man, just soaking wet as I am. I thought, sitting there, sitting there listening at the Word, Amen. that the rest of the world thinks is crazy. See? They are, they are the bolt. See? God's here to thread it up. Draw you right out of your sickness. <laughs> it's the promise of the Word. Amen. Just remember, it'll start tightening. I will draw. If I be lifted up, I'll draw. He'll draw it out of you. <laughs> he sure will. You just believe Him. Have faith in Him. Don't doubt Him. Believe Him. Pray for me. When you have no one else to pray for, just remember me. And then... Until we meet, till we meet, till we meet. Thanks for coming those long ways. God protects you as you go home. Till we meet. Greet all the Christians. Salute them from this group here. God's peace upon you. Shalom. God be with you till we meet again. Mm -hmm. yeah, we I'm so glad. See, there's some many things I don't know, but there's some things I do know. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so glad to be associated with you. I, I'm so glad to be one of you. God be with you. He will. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He won't leave you. You've done broke through the veil now. Hallelujah. 
I'm so glad tonight to see Brother Palmer, one of our associate pastors over here from Georgia. Brother Junior Jackson's in the building somewhere back in the corner. We're glad to have him. Brother Don Ruddle sitting over here. Oh, so many. I don't know if I miss anybody. Brother Ben Bryant here and many of the others here. Fine brother Wilbur Collins. We're so glad to have all of you here. I wonder if we just stand to our feet just a moment now. Let's bow our heads down. Till we Feel that closest of fellowship with the Spirit? Let's hum it. Mm. I noticed Brother McKinney from Ohio with us. Brother John Martin and his brother. So glad to have all of you. I might not even see you, brother. He knows you. Tell we me. May my heart and yours with God's heart be one till we meet. While we bow our heads in our prayer, try to let every minister know that we're happy for him to be here. All the laity, you people from Tennessee, Ohio, and across the country, some women I met over there today, all the way from Boston, our colored brother, Monsieur, this morning from up in there also. So many from different parts of the country. I thank you, my dear loyal friend. God be with you. I call you my friend. Remember what Jesus said about that? Closer even than a brother. A friend. While we bow our heads now until we get to meet again in the next few days, God be with you. I'm going to ask our good loyal brother, Brother Richard Blair, if he won't dismiss us in a word of prayer. Brother Blair.